I'm ready to go. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'll uh, be giving lectures on black holes and and well, quantum aspects of black holes mainly. Uh, I'll be here this week. I'm leaving Thursday, so and please, uh, if you have any questions, find me in the coffee time or in the lunch or whatever and, and ask me questions. Um, so as references, uh, so I put some slides, some older slides I had in the, in, in the web page. Uh, there are also many lectures uh, online. Um, there is one that by uh, There are also, uh, Witten, Witten wrote some lectures on some aspects of uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, so soon after the discovery of soon after the discovery of general relativity, Schwarzschild uh, wrote down uh, this metric um, as an exact solution um, for general relativity, uh, which is uh, spherically symmetric. Okay, the simplest solution of the vacuum equations in general relativity. This is the volume element of an S2. Um, and this function f uh, is um, 1 minus uh, some constant, uh, which we call Rh, or sometimes called Rs, over R. Okay? This is the Schwarzschild metric for a Schwarzschild, we now call it a Schwarzschild black hole, um, in, um, in four dimensions. We will be also considering black holes in any other number of dimensions where uh, this sphere could be changed to a sphere in some other number of dimensions, uh, and then this function will be uh, a bit different. Um, for example, for black holes in anti de Sitter space, this function is r squared plus 1 minus some constant over r, uh, and so on. Um, in other dimensions, uh, this power changes. But in all cases, uh, the confusing and interesting aspect of this metric is that there is some value of r, in this case rh, we are always going to define it to be rh, where f is actually zero. Okay. Uh, this is what caused confusions a uh, long time ago, uh, because um, the, w w what is the factor that multiplies the time direction? So um, it's, in some sense, it's the relativistic analog of the gravitational potential. Um, so if you had, uh, in the expansion around flat space, we have the gravitational potential. There is some factor of two, perhaps, here. But it's one plus something, which is essentially the Newtonian potential, and phi is very small. Uh, so that's the uh, usual expansion. Um, and uh, this factor uh, tells us a few things. So uh, we sometimes call it red. So we have some time translation symmetry. And uh, so it's negative, so I put the, the absolute value of sign. So the square root of that tells us the uh, difference between uh, this time t, that this coordinate time t that appears here, relative to proper time. So proper time is uh, dt proper is equal to this times dt. Okay. And if this goes to zero, it means that uh, this time runs for, would run for a long time, a million years, and this proper time doesn't run at all. Okay. So you have an extreme case of uh, redshift, gravitational redshift. Of course, in any, many systems, time uh, passes differently uh, different, uh, in different places in the gravitational potential. I mean, if you are here at the bottom of the room or the top of the room, the, the time passes differently. And here in Colorado, actually, they have the best clocks that can measure very tiny time height differences. Uh, we are in the, the place of the best clocks. Um, 
Uh, also, similarly, if we have uh, the energy, so imagine you have a particle that uh, sits at the fixed position R, um, then, uh, and it has some proper energy E, um, e proper. Uh, so this is the proper energy of the particle. It could be the mass of the particle if uh, the particle is just there at rest, not moving in the R direction. It's related to the energy measured from infinity by, similarly, by a similar factor. Okay. So if you put a particle of mass m at uh, a position close to Rh, uh, its energy as seen from infinity will be very small, al almost zero. Now, of course, this caused a lot of uh, questions and uh, confusions. And the people who first thought about this were quite confused about this. Um, of, co of course, uh, this was later understood. And the idea is to just choose some better coordinates near. So, so it was understood that this is just a coordinate singularity. And we can just choose uh, better coordinates. And so we can um, expand the function f around rh and choose. Uh, so I'm going to so expand in r minus rh. So we could choose r minus rh as a coordinate. But it's a little more convenient to choose some coordinate rho that differs uh, from this by um, some factor, so f prime of rh. Um, and these factors are just put there so that the metric, once uh, we rewrite it near, uh, when this is very small, uh, it looks like uh, d rho squared, or maybe let me put first the time direction. It looks like uh, minus rho squared uh, d tau squared plus uh, d rho squared. Okay. And I've also uh, redefined the time. So, uh, so again, by a similar factor, f prime of rh uh, times the time t. Okay. I mean, we can we can check uh, we can check this by. Um, so when we expand the function f, we get a factor of f, f prime times r minus rh. So that's f prime times. And this f prime square with a quarter is absorbed in the normalization of tau. And then we get this first term. And you can check that the second term also, uh, we get this d rho square. OK, so this, um, this space time might uh, seem unfamiliar, but well, it's, just, it's called Rindler space. And it's just simply flat space uh, in some funny coordinates, in the analog of radial coordinates. In fact, this space is the same as uh, ordinary Minkowski space. Uh, in some new coordinates, which uh, are defined to be x0 uh, plus minus x1 equal to um, uh, plus minus rho e to the plus minus tau. Okay? So um, in other words, uh, we, we, get, we have flat space where the time direction goes. Uh, so the time direction is vertical. The space direction is horizontal. And then we can have these directions x plus and x minus. So sometimes called the light concordinates. And then, uh, then a surface of constant rho, a line of constant rho, would be uh, a line in two dimensions that uh, follows this trajectory. Okay? So this is uh, rho equal to constant. And as we move along this direction, uh, tau basically, so if, since rho is a constant, well, this uh, time is basically the proper time up to a rescaling factor of order rho. Okay? Um, now, this trajectory is accelerating and has an acceleration. Um, so uh, what's the acceleration of this trajectory, the proper acceleration? Um, what's the only quantity? The acceleration has units of, uh, we, are, we are in units where c is 1. We're, we're going to always use unit where c is 1 and h bar is 1. Okay. Um, so. Velocity has dimension 0, and acceleration has dimensions of 1 over length or 1 over time. There's only one length in this business, which is rho. And so acceleration is actually 1 over rho. And the coefficient is also 1. Okay? So you can check that if you want. Um, but well, you could check it here, where, the, uh, where it's almost not moving. And you see that uh, this is a par parabola around that point. So the usual. Um, OK, so that's, um, yes. Hard to see. OK, good. So maybe I'll, uh, try, I'll try to remember not to use it. OK, so that's, uh, that's what we uh, have. Uh, now, what's the full geometry? So the full geometry 
can be um, expressed in terms of something called Penrose diagrams. So a Penrose diagram consists of taking the original metric and multiplying the original metric by an overall factor okay? that maps the infinite four-dimensional space to a finite uh, region. Time. Now, we will be always, we will be mainly considering things, well, essentially always considering things which are spherically symmetric. So we're going to ignore the dimensions of the sphere and we're not going to plot the directions of the sphere explicitly. Okay? So we're going to be drawing two-dimensional Penrose diagrams. Um, so for example, if we have two-dimensional flat Minkowski space, we can uh, represent the two-dimensional flat Minkowski space as a Penrose diagram of this kind, where x plus and x minus will go, well, this line should be at 45 degrees, and this should look like a square. Um, and uh, this is infinity, where you are infinitely far, and this is infinity going in the other direction. Okay. Um, we, if, if we are in higher dimensions, we would draw for flat space a similar diagram, uh, where this line here is r equal to zero, and at each point on this space, there is a two-dimensional sphere, which is infinite here far away in proper size, and has zero size here at the origin. Uh, and this is just, but it, it shrinks in a completely smooth way, but this is just the origin of flat space. Now, if we take uh, that metric and we, uh, oh, there is one point I should probably have mentioned, which is that uh, these coordinates that we have here uh, cover only this outside region of, uh, Rindler space, okay? But of course, uh, the, this, if you are given this metric, uh, you can extend the space by, for example, choosing these coordinates to full Minkowski space, okay? So similarly, uh, the coordinates uh, written here for R bigger than RH could cover only a portion of the full space-time geometry uh, that, we, uh, that that solution describes, and the full, uh, full space-time uh, has uh, this form, uh, has this Penrose diagram. So again, uh, the vertical direction is roughly time, the horizontal direction is roughly space. They've been rescaled, so we took that metric, we rescaled uh, space, and we, we multiplied the metric by an overall factor. Um, and in this type of diagrams, light rays uh, follow lines of 45 degrees, so they're only mo they move at 45 degree lines. Um, in particular, um, so, so this is uh, spatial infinity, infinity in the far in the future, in the, in the, in the future and the past. Um, the, the, the point r equal to rh is really this whole line and this whole uh, portion of a land line. Um, and uh, so similarly to how here, uh, the point rho equal to zero uh, corresponds to this full uh, line. So as we, if you are approaching this line, you find that rho goes to zero and t goes to infinity in such a way that uh, x, let's say, x plus remains finite. Um, OK, so um, that's uh, what we have. Um, and so this is, uh, in this region, the sphere goes to zero size, but in a, in a way that makes the space-time curvature uh, diverge. So this uh, we call the singularity. Um, um, and this is the region, this region far away looks like flat space. And this is the, what we call the future black hole horizon, or sometimes black hole horizon. And this is the past uh, horizon, or sometimes called the white hole horizon. Um, so this is, we like to call this the future interior. Uh, and this is the right exterior. Uh, this is the left exterior. And this is the past interior. There is no matter anywhere in this geometry. This is a solution of vac vacuum Einstein's equations. Um, um, and it uh, contains two exteriors joined by, uh, by the space-time. Um, so we can think of this as a kind of wormhole. Um, it has uh, some isometries. Um, so the, the time translation symmetry of, uh, of that metric. Uh, produces an isometry that moves points along these directions, okay? So if you are far away here, that isometry looks like time, ordinary time translations. Near this point, uh, that isometry looks like boosts, right? So again, here, uh, we can have Minkowski space, it's just ordinary Minkowski space, 
If we do a time translation, we rescale the x plus and x minus coordinates, or if we go to x0 and x1, we have the usual cautious and cinches that we have when we have boosts. So this acts as a boost. Again, a boost will move these points forwards and these points, um, but it will move the points in this uh, particular way. Okay. In particular, this isometry looks uh, time-like here, but it looks like space here. Here in this region, it looks a bit like a space translation. Okay. Now people say, well, a black hole is a place where time becomes space and space becomes time. This is not really a good way to think about it. The thing, the thing that happens is that it has some isometry, and uh, the isometry acts like a boost uh, in the near horizon geometry. Uh, and flat space, we also have this feature. So it's not, this feature is not peculiar to a uh, black hole. What's peculiar to a black hole, and what's most peculiar, is that there is a, a region of space-time that cannot send signals to infinity, so the presence of a horizon. And that uh, is something that will cause uh, several interesting effects, and we'll be, we'll be exploring the consequences of this, uh, of this feature a lot. Um, OK, so that's uh, the geometry of the Schwarzschild solution. And this geometry was quite confusing, so now we understand it completely. This is the picture. We can uh, make it a little more precise. By, I could show you the explicit coordinates that, where you can see very clearly this geometry. They're called Kruskal coordinates. Uh, if you want to Google them. Um, and it took about 50 years from the time that the geometry was found till the time it was understood that this is what it describes. So black holes are somewhat confusing. And uh, we, um, we, are, we are still confused about some aspects of black holes. Um, now, we should also talk about the black hole uh, geometry that is produced by a collapsing body. So. In that case, the uh, geometry is not what we uh, had there. Uh, the geometry produced by a collapsing body would have, uh, let's say, a collapsing star, a ball of dust, let's say, that collapses, would have a geometry that uh, looks roughly like this. So uh, this is, again, the region far away, infinity. Um, R equal to zero is the center of the ball of dust. Um, and this ball of dust is, uh, let's say, might be coming from far away and collapsing and collapses into a black hole, the horizon forms, and there is a region of space-time that will not be able to send signals to infinity. Okay? We have now the, only the black hole horizon part. The geometry here in this region, the not uh, shaded region, uh, it's a portion of the Schwarzschild geometry and it's a solution of vacuum Einstein equations. The geometry here is not the solution of vacuum Einstein equations, it's the solution of Einstein's equations to matter. Okay? So that's the geometry here. And a geometry roughly like this is the one that is uh, supposed to be produced by astrophysical black holes. So if you uh, have an astrophysical black hole, you expect to have uh, such a geometry. It will not be uh, the geometry we had above. Okay? But this region uh, is common to both this geometry and that geometry. And for black holes that collapse, uh, there could be perturbations, uh, let's say, away from spherical symmetry and so on. And these perturbations decay with a characteristic time. This is, I'm just stating the result, um, which is usually the, uh, for spherically symmetric, let's say for black holes in 4D, uh, some characteristic times which are of order the Schwarzschild radius. Okay. So relatively quickly, uh, these perturbations uh, go out and, well, the, the, these perturbations decay. And of course, you've probably all seen the, this, uh, in the gravitational signals gravitational wave signals, how the signal decays is related to the decay of these perturbations. Uh, very good. Now, it's often said that uh, black holes have uh, very high density, um, and you need to contract matter to very high densities to form a black hole. But that's not the case. And it's important uh, that if you have some object of any density, so let's say density of air, uh, so you have some density rho, or some density of matter, you have a very, very big sphere, so let's say a volume R cubed, then uh, the Schwarzschild radius, which is given by, I didn't say what RH was here, but if we have something of mass m, uh, RH uh, is equal to 2G Newton m. Okay. It's curious that that form, well, maybe I won't. Um, so if this is uh, of order R, uh, or um, 
okay? Uh, then, uh, or, or bigger, so if the, the, the mass uh, in this region is uh, bigger than R, then you could form a black hole. But if you take R, R big enough, this will always be bigger, okay? Um, size you can uh, R and MR for various densities. For example, uh, if rho is the density of air, or rho is equal to the density of uh, nuclear matter, okay? Uh, please do these exercises, because uh, they will, you will get masses that are going to be familiar, and, and the reason that they are familiar from the astrophysics discussion, and the reason they are familiar is precisely because of this, uh, this type of uh, relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, one other comment since we are discussing these black holes as uh, they might form in nature. Uh, in, in nature, the, it's, relevant, it's important that black holes are rotating. So they, all always, they will always, always have some rotation. And there are a few important physical effects that are related to ro rotation. And we, we will, so those interesting physical effects that are important for astrophysics and for making connection to the observational features of black holes uh, are not going to be important for what we are going to discuss, or the aspects of black holes that we are going to discuss. And the aspects of black holes we are going to discuss are also present uh, for rotating black holes, um, but the, the spherically symmetric ones are simpler, so we'll discuss just the spherically symmetric ones in these lectures. Um, okay. Uh, one extra point is that normally it is said that the uh, black hole singularity is produced when the, all the matter of the star collapses to a point, okay? Now, the, the matter of the star could collapse to a point here, but uh, no matter of any star is collapsing to a point here, okay? So there is just the vacuum that is uh, forming the singularity. That's another little point. Um, of course, the singularity is inside the black hole, but it's not at the point. The singularity is a place in, uh, a place in time somehow. So when you go forwards in time, you encounter the singularity. It's more like a cosmological singularity. So if you are inside, uh, you will collapse into the singularity, you won't be able to escape. Okay? And the interior of a black hole looks a bit like a collapsing universe. It's not a homogeneous collapsing universe. This direction is different than the uh, sphere directions. The sphere directions are shrinking at a different rate than this, the, the, the way that uh, direction is expanding, actually. Um, so, um, but we hope that by understanding black holes, eventually we'll be able to understand what happens to this singularity, and um, hopefully that will teach us something about the cosmological singularities. So th this is part of the motivation. Let, let, me, let me try to motivate uh, the study of quantum aspects of black holes. As we're going to see, quantum aspects are not very important for the black holes that exist in nature. So the main reason to study quantum aspects of black holes is that uh, by studying the quantum aspects, we'll understand how black hole and quantum mechanics works. We'll understand uh, eventually, we don't understand that now, but we'll understand eventually what happens at the singularity. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to extract some lessons from cosmology where we also have some, probably some initial singularity and we'll observe, find some observational features. Uh, okay, so that's uh, somehow some, yeah. No, it's just, just to make the line different. It's just uh, conventional. No, it's not wavy. It's, it's not wavy. It's just a straight line. Well, there, there is one, one reason to make it wavy is that it is indeed a straight line for the unperturbed black hole. If you were to make perturbations of the black hole, this, the structure of the space time here becomes uh, fractal and very complicated. Because uh, perturbations, uh, if you perturb this geometry a little bit, that per those perturbations get amplified in this region. And so on, the singularity structure is more complicated. So that's maybe one reason for making But yeah, so if we are talking about spherically symmetric black holes, it should be uh, more like a straight line. Uh, it, it might be, a, in some cases, uh, depending on the, your coordinate choices, it might be a curved line like this. So for the ADS, uh, black holes is a curved line that curves downwards. But those features are not important for, uh, for what we are going to discuss. The important point is that the, an observer that goes in encounters a singularity. So, uh, and we don't know how to continue the semi-classical equations past the singularity. Um, okay. 
Now, we discussed some, uh, here some coordinates that make the space-time look nice uh, near, the, um, near r equal to zero. And that region near r equal, well, r equal to r h, actually. Uh, that region is this region uh, that, that lies near the horizon. So it's this whole region here. It's well described, well approximated by flat space. Now, there are some other coordinates that are useful uh, for some purposes. And uh, they're called the Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. They were the first coordinates that uh, were defined to get rid of a singularity. Um, and um, so we define a new coordinate v through uh, this relationship. Um, and uh, so we get rid of the, of, of, the, of the coordinate time by defining this new time dv. Um, and then uh, the metric. Uh, dv dr, so minus f dv squared plus r d omega squared, r squared. So the advantage of this is that now the metric has only this off-diagonal uh, component. And um, sorry, well, this is diagonal. But the, the, the metric now has, uh, well, uh, is something here and then one here. So the determinant of this matrix is just, uh, just non-vanishing, non just minus 1. Um, so, um, OK, it's not vanishing anywhere. Um, now, in these coordinates, um, the, if, if you have v constant and you move in r, you can see from this metric that that's a null ray. And so these are these ingoing light null rays are rays of uh, uh, v equal to constant. Okay. And then uh, the other light rays uh, can be obtained by setting the other radially outgoing light rays can be obtained by setting this to zero. So, um, and then uh, setting that to zero, you get that dr dv is equal to one half f. Okay. So if f is positive, then um, let's say this is this is the line uh, where f is equal to zero, so r equal to r h. Um, and so if f is positive, then those light rays will eventually uh, have an r which will be increasing and will go all the way to infinity. And when, uh, when r is negative, it's sort of exponentially de deviate from here. Um, and some go into the black hole, and some go out of the black hole. OK? Now, here, here I'm saying that uh, this near, so this goes like f prime rh. Uh, so some constant, this is just some constant, r minus rh. OK? And so this is an exponent. So r minus rh, so this could be r minus rh. Um, so we have, we have an equation that tells us that depending on the sign, we'll either, well, we, it will grow exponentially, but uh, either to positive values or to negative values. Um, in particular, it's showing that, uh, that um, somehow this looks a little bit like an expanding universe, that the region here is stretching. So if you had two uh, friends that are, well, two light rays that started close to, the, to each other, uh, they will start uh, separating from each other. So it looks a bit like an expanding universe. It's stretching. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, let's uh, let's discuss another space that. Um, so there is uh, a space which is uh, called the Sitter space. That's uh, an ex describes an expanding universe. It's a Penrose diagram. Uh, looks looks like this. Um, here now, this is r equal to zero. So this is a point where the s two shrinks to zero. Um, this whole surface looks like uh, an S3. Um, the full space time can also be drawn somehow like this. Um, kind of shrinks and then expands again. And here we have an observer who sits at the, let's say, north pole of the S3. Um, and here the, we have one that sits at the south pole of the S3. Um, now, if you are uh, this observer, uh, you see a time independent uh, background but with the horizon. So you'll find the horizon. That's from uh, this region here. So any other observer that moves through here also sees something similar. Uh, and there is no singularity in this case. So this is uh, just asymptotically the sitter space. Um, but we also have a horizon. And we have an isometry that, again, uh, behaves like a boost uh, near in the near horizon region, or in, in this region. OK. 
Now, if you want to understand some aspects of the classical geometry of black holes, another question you can ask is, if you have some uh, observer, let me use a different color chalk, that uh, is falling from the near horizon region into the black hole, there is some time it will take uh, this observer to fall into the singularity. And you can check that that time, since they cross the horizon, to the, they hit the singularity, is always smaller than this time. And you can calculate what this time is. And in fact, in fact, this time will be of order RH for the Schwarzschild black hole. Maybe it's something I should have mentioned, well, is that the Schwarzschild, the Schwarzschild geometry is really, well, of course, a family of geometries characterized by this value RH. And so we can, we can rescale the geometry. So we, we have black holes of all possible sizes. So black holes don't come with one particular size. We can have black holes of all possible sizes and all possible masses. And this is the only dimension, this is the only dimension, dimension full constant that we have here in the metric. And so these times that we are talking about will be of order RH. And that's the same reason why the decay time was also given by some constant times RH, the, the, the decay time of perturbations of the geometry. Um, if you are outside the geometry, if you are outside, perturbations decay or dumped. Um, if you are here, if you are moving inside, perturbations grow, as we discussed. Okay, okay so those are all various aspects of uh, classical geometry, the classical geometry of black holes. Um, now, one more uh, classical aspect of black holes that is relevant to the discussion um, is the fact that here we discussed uh, a black hole that is spherically symmetric. Um, but if you have some small perturbations, we said that perturbations grow. And it could be that perturbations grow and lead to a new geometry that does not have a singularity. So that could be, uh, could, could have been in principle. Um, however, there is a singularity theorem Uh, that was originally proven by Penrose, that shows that um, that under certain conditions that I will specify, um, you'll always get some kind of uh, singularity. You cannot extend this space-time forever into the future. There is always some problem, um, even without spherical symmetry. So I'm not going to prove the theorem. I'm only going to state the conditions so that at least you know what the, the conditions are. So first is, um, so the first condition, condition number one, is uh, that there exists a trap surface. So let me try to say what the trap surface is. Um, so let's uh, here draw the, for example, well, let's say we have a collapsing black hole. Um, now a normal surface is a surface, for example, here outside. We call that each point here represents a two-dimensional sphere. So. Um, so normal surface is one where if you look at the light rays coming out of the surface, uh, let's say one contracts, one, and you look at the same surface, well, you follow the light rays and you look at the, the surface after a little while, uh, this surface will be a little bigger and this surface will be a little smaller because these are light rays sort of going in and these are light rays going out, the surface is getting large. So this is a normal surface. Now if you do the same thing but for a surface that is here, um, and you look at these light rays, okay? Um, what what are these light rays going to do? So they they are moving forward. So forwards in the black hole interior uh, correspond to moving to smaller values of r. Notice that uh, the r direction, uh, when r is less than r h, uh, this function f is negative, and uh, the r direction is time-like. So moving forwards in time is just moving to smaller values of r. So those two. Um, those two surfaces are going to be both smaller, okay? Even the one that uh, you might have thought, oh, maybe goes out in this diagram, but they're both going to become smaller. And so this is a trap surface. Okay. So you might not know what happens here, but uh, if you have a space that, that in some approximation has a trap surface, then this first condition is obeyed, okay? The second condition is the a condition on the stress tensor. Uh, it's called the null energy condition that says that the null-null components of the stress tensor are uh, bigger or equal uh, than zero. So this is roughly the energy density minus the momentum density. Uh, now, this is true for uh, any classical matter. It's not true for quantum matter. Um, 
And so, um, but to, to prove this theorem, you only need to integrate uh, the null energy condition along a trajectory, and that's uh, in some cases in quant. Well, I, 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 I don't know whether it's been proven uh, taking the most general quantum matter into account. So we are, we are going to have just a classical discussion. Um, three is that uh, we have a non compact. Uh, Cauchy slice. So Cauchy slice is a slice which uh, holds space time and that we are making the assumption that the space time is what's called globally hyperbolic. That means that uh, you can determine the solution everywhere in the future from initial data on this slice. Okay. So an example, um, yeah. Um, so for example, when we have this uh, collapsing black hole, we could take this slice and the whole geometry of the space time can be determined uh, by following uh, this to the future. And this slice is uh, non-compact. Okay, That's another uh, property we need. And if we have these three properties, then we'll have some kind of singularity. Um, Penrose did not prove that this is a curvature singularity. He just proved that you cannot extend the space-time any further beyond a certain point. Uh, now, one case where uh, I, I mentioned before the case of the Sitter space, or maybe it's already here. Um, so a surface that is here, um, so if you have a, um, um, yeah, so a, a, a surface that, um, yeah, let me, so if you take, for example, uh, imagine a, a, a very big S2, right, uh, which is at this point, so this is a surface. The surface will be contracting in these two directions, so it will be trapped. Okay, so it has a trapped surface. Um, the sitter has trapped surfaces. The null energy condition is trivial, but it does not have a non-compact Cauchy slice. So in this case, if you take a slice here through the whole space-time, it's compact. It's just a three, and uh, there is no singularity. So this is an example for why we needed the, at least that uh, part of the, the argument. OK, so those are important properties of classical black holes. So black holes uh, well can form. Uh, they uh, contain some kind of singularity in the interior, um, and so on. OK, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the, the Penrose diagram of ADS is indeed similar to the one in ADS. Um, actually, I don't need to even erase. Well, I, I need to erase only this. Um, so in that case, uh, so this is a black hole in ADS. Black hole in ADS. Um, and this is the ADS boundary. So here, uh, well, again, we have an S, the boundary is S2 times time. But the S2 uh, has, well, infinite size, right? Uh, it does not shrink to zero as in the sitter. Um, and here, uh, there is some kind of singularity. And depending on the dimensionality, uh, we would draw it like this or, yeah, or, or a straight line. Um, or in some cases, it's uh, maybe an null line. In some, cases, there is, in some cases, the structure of the singularity is a little, well, there is some, some slight. Uh, so if you look at classical black holes, um, for example, for charged black holes, the uh, structure of singularities is a bit different. This is the Penrose diagram of a charged black hole, just to give you a complete discussion. Um, and then this repeats itself. So this is just the Penrose diagram of uh, the charged uh, black hole solution. Uh, it has what's called an outer horizon, which is this, and an inner horizon, which is this one. The singularity is time-like as opposed to space-like. And in this geometry, if you go in, you can come out in a different copy of the space-time. Okay. Um, now, this, this, this inner horizon is believed to be unstable, that if you perform small perturbations outside, they will become very blue shifted in this region, and this will become an actual singularity. Okay? In the original space time, it was not. But, um, so we normally think of these uh, other copies as unphysical, that they will not arise in a physical situation. But it, it might be that in, well, this is just a side, completely side comment. It might be that under a suitable interpretation, there might be some interpretation of this geometry where they are physical. 
Because the same used to be said about this one here, that this side is unphysical because it's not present in the collapsing black hole. But now we have some interpretations for this geometry where it is physical. So anyway, but, but at present we don't have it. And there are these arguments saying that the inner horizon will develop a singularity. OK, very good. Any other question? Yes. Well, I can tell you just in an example where if you don't assume it's uh, right, this is a proof of what we want to do um, well you 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 are proving that I think the proof involves following these light rays um, and showing that um, this this light rays will have some image in the original Cauchy slice that will be compact uh, and it had to be non compact um, that's roughly the, the argument. Um, it, it will be compact because uh, you, cannot, you cannot extend this uh, light rays more than, uh, um, well, there is the Rachel Dury equation that we'll see in a second that uh, says that you cannot extend them more than a certain amount. And then that whole forwards evolution, when you go back to the original slice, it will be a compact. Uh, it, it should be the whole slice, but it's just only the compact portion. Um, so you need a few results in order to get to this. Uh, and um, if, you want, if you want the full explanation of all, all that you need to understand this theorem, I would recommend those Witten lectures. Uh, they are called uh, light rays and all that uh, by Edward Witten. Um, OK. They, they're also described in uh, Wald's book, in, in Wald's general relativity book. Is there a eraser? The erasers. I need to start the erasing. So okay. So now we're going to take the same geometry that we have here, um, and we are going to um, make a time Euclidean. So we're going to consider a Euclidean version of this black hole and see uh, what we can learn from that. So um, so now uh, we're going to take t equal to i t Euclidean, right? This will put a plus sign here, and now we have T Euclidean. OK? Um, very good. So we can do the same. Uh, so now we also have the same change of coordinates that we had here. We, put, we can put Euclidean here everywhere. Um, and we have plus here, right? So now, uh, so what this is saying is just that the geometry near uh, where r was equal to rh, where f was shrinking, uh, just looks like uh, polar coordinates in, uh, in two dimensions, okay? two dimensional flat space in polar coordinates. Um, very good. So, that, and in particular, it will be non singular if this tau Euclidean uh, has uh, the appropriate period, which is tau Euclidean plus 2 pi. Okay? Um, very good. So that tau Euclidean equal to 2 pi trans translates into a period for t Euclidean, so the original time, which is t Euclidean plus uh, beta, OK? Some constant that depends on the derivative of this function. Um, and so the geometry uh, looks like as follows. So I'm going to sketch the geometry. So this is the time direction now. It will be a circle of size beta. And the space direction uh, r uh, will form a cigar-like geometry where it has constant size far away because f goes to 1 far away. And here, near uh, at rh, uh, it shrinks smoothly uh, with no problem. OK, very good. So that's uh, what we have. So what can we learn about this geometry? So this is a curiosity so far. So we can do the Euclidean continuation of the black hole. We get this. Okay? And there is the curiosity that if you choose beta appropriately, uh, so how big beta should be depends on what the value of Rh is and the mass of the black hole. But if you choose it appropriately, we'll have this geometry. Now, now imagine we have some quantum fields on this geometry. Now, we have quantum fields on a geometry which contains a circle of size beta. That type of geometry arises when we uh, consider field theory at finite temperature. Circle uh, is related to uh, QFT or quantum mechanics at finite temperature, where the temperature is one over beta. Okay. 
Um, so, so, so this problem. So what I'm saying here is that if you have quantum field theory on a on let's say R three times S one, uh, that's the type of space time you should consider if we were considering uh, quantum field theory at finite temperature. And far away, that's that's exactly what we have. So. Uh, this uh, geometry appears I if we had quantum field theory at finite temperature. So if we have quantum fields he th here, that's describing quantum fields at finite temperature far away. And then we have this uh, curious geometry. And we're going to interpret that as a black hole that is in thermal equilibrium uh, with uh, quantum fields outside at finite temperature. Okay, um, okay this, this looks like a quick argument. Let's, uh, let's go back here uh, to Rindler space. I mean, this, what, what we just said does not really depend on having the black hole. That just uh, depends on, um, on having a Euclidean circle of constant size. So let's uh, now uh, consider uh, this Euclidean space, where uh, now the circles at constant r look like this. Again, they are circles um, of uh, finite size. Um, the total proper length of these circles is the 2 pi rho, right? and that's supposed to be the inverse temperature. Right? Um, so if we go to the Lorentzian version of that spacetime, then that Lorentzian version uh, contains uh, these observers that are with constant acceleration. And, um, and so the fact that in Euclidean space they have constant size of that order implies that uh, in Lorentzian signature we uh, they will have a temperature which is one over two pi rho. And if we look at the formula for the acceleration, we can also write it as a over two pi. Okay. So um, this is the, the surprising feature. Uh, that an observer that is with constant acceleration in, uh, in Minkowski space should see a temperature which uh, is of this, of this order. Well, it's equal to that. I mean, given by this formula. This is sometimes called the Unruh effect. Um, OK. Um, so we can, we can start, uh, the, if you believe this formula in, uh, let's say that this is an effect in flat space, and so here, look, this, this way of deriving the effect in flat space looks too quick and maybe slightly unbelievable. In fact, uh, I believe that the first people who derived it, the, the effect, I'm not sure they believed that there would be a temperature. In fact, they, I, I think they didn't even talk about the temperature in their paper. That was Bisonian and Bichman. Um, and Unruh really uh, didn't know about this previous work and was considering, uh, the un inspired by the Hawking calculation, he was considering this. Uh, uh, this setup and consider what a detector, so if you have an observer moving here and with a detector, whether that detector, uh, let's say a thermometer, that thermometer would really uh, measure a temperature. And he argued that it did indeed measure a temperature. Um, okay, so, um, and well, we could have a longer discussion of uh, how to, uh, yeah, how to derive this effect in some other ways. Um, but this is the somehow quickest argument. Uh, that I know, and um, and once uh, well, once we have this formula for the inverse temperature in this uh, in this Rinder region, we can go back to the original um, to the original time coordinate and write uh, a formula for for beta, which uh, depends on this, and that implies uh, well that that will get the formula for the temperature. Um, well, we, we, you, 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 as an exercise, you can calculate the formula for the temperature uh, in terms of uh, this rho prime. Uh, so, so beta, or the inverse temperature, is 2 pi times 2 over this f prime. Um, OK, so that's uh, the formula. We just simply try this rescaling we did to go to the near horizon geometry. That's also a quick formula, to derive, quick way to derive the temperature. There is one word of caution that. Um, I should mention sometimes uh, people write the formula as uh, surface gravity divided by 2 pi as the formula for the temperature. Um, so it's uh, similar to this formula. Um, it should be exercised with some, the, the caution is simply that this is not 
the surface gravity that appears here is not the proper gravity that an observer sitting at the horizon would see. That observer is infinitely accelerated because it would be similar to the observer that sits at r equal to zero in uh, Rindler space. Um, so this is the surface gravity, but redshifted uh, to infinity. Okay, and um, so it's not really a proper surface gravity uh, in, in the usual sense. I mean, it's not like uh, if you go, you ask about the surface gravity of the moon, is the gravity you see on the surface of the moon? That that's not. Uh, the gravity on the surface of the black hole, just as a word of caution so that you're not confused by the no nomenclature. Um, okay. Um, now, okay, and, and notice that this rotation in Euclidean signature becomes the boost in uh, Lorentzian signature. Yeah, an exercise. So an exercise is to... Um, Imagine that you have an acceleration, let's say, pick, a, pick an, uh, your favorite acceleration, let's say, g equal to 10 meters over second squared, and calculate what the temperature is. Okay. That's an exercise of putting h bars and c's in this formula. Um, OK. Um, very good. Um, another, another question, this is a more conceptual question. Um, is the following. This is a more non-trivial question. Um, so you, you, you will calculate there and you will get some answer. Oh, before, be, before we go to that question, um, a temperature is, of course, related to a length scale, uh, beta. And uh, this length scale is the length scale of the typical radiation that comes out of the object okay, or, uh, that you will see at that temperature. Okay, so if you have uh, radiation at temperature t, its wavelength is 1 over beta or, or um, now, in the case of the black hole, that uh, for a spherically symmetric black hole, that this temperature works out to be uh, of order r h. Remember that that's the only length scale we had, um, and so uh, so that's the typical wavelength of the radiation that comes out of the black hole. Um, okay. Um, now, it, it, so it's important in, in order to see this effect that the space-time really continues all the way to the horizon and that it's smooth at the horizon. So if you were to put a mirror here, an accelerating mirror, mirror that reflects the radiation, then there will be a state that could be a state with zero temperature. Okay. Um, similarly, if you have uh, the Schwarzschild geometry, but uh, you cut off uh, part of the geometry and you just have simply have a star, right? Um, erase everything. So you have the exterior of the Schwarzschild geometry, but you have simply a star, right? Um, then uh, here, G0, 0 never goes to 0, but G0, 0 varies, but there is no temperature. There could be, the, you, you could have a, a gravitating body at 0 temperature. Okay. Now the question I'm going to ask you is, if you are sitting on the surface of the Earth, or standing on the surface of the Earth, subject under the acceleration G, the question is where you see uh, the temperature that you computed through this formula. Okay. Um, now, there is um, a general comment that I would like to make about this. Uh, oh, this is, I don't like the wet. Is this not wet? Yeah, it's not wet. Uh, let me make a comment about uh, temperatures and gravitational redshift. Okay, this has nothing to do with black holes, but it's uh, hopefully clarifying. Um, so imagine you have some situation where you have some coordinate r. We have, let's say, the gravitating star that we discussed there, and we, which has some redshift factor, which uh, has roughly this form. Uh, so this is GTT. Uh, so it's, let's say, one far away, and then something smaller than one here at the center of the star. And let's say you have uh, this whole object in thermal equilibrium. Okay, and you want to calculate what the uh, proper temperature is everywhere. So it turns out that the proper temperature is actually not constant. So the proper temperature uh, depends on the position. So this is the, the proper temperature. And it's given by uh, the temperature at infinity uh, divided by uh, square root of uh, GTT. Okay. So in this particular case, the temperature here at the center uh, will be higher than the temperature far away. So if you have, so similarly, uh, as an exercise, you could 
consider having, for example, a box uh, with gas here in the room under the gravitational field. Uh, and you can calculate the difference in temperature between the bottom of the box and the top of the box okay, in thermal equilibrium. Um, so uh, the proper temperature is not constant. And indeed, in, well, we discussed that this geometry represents the, the black hole in thermal equilibrium. Uh, the proper temperature here varies as you, uh, I mean, it's, it's increasing because the circle is shrinking. It go, goes to infinity at the horizon. OK. Um, OK, now we'll discuss uh, black hole evaporation. Um, so and the geometry of an evaporating black hole. Am I going too slowly? Or Raise your hand if I, you think I'm going too slowly. <laughs> OK. Um, OK, so, um, so we discussed the geometry of a black hole that collapses. Uh, now we'll discuss, but if we have this collapsing black hole, this is the matter that collapses. So we'll start having uh, some finite temperature uh, in this region that will imply that we'll have some radiation coming out. We don't have any radiation coming in. So, um, and, um, so in the, 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 the one that was in equilibrium had radiation coming in and radiation going out. Uh, but here, we just have radiation uh, going out. And therefore, the mass of the black hole will start decreasing. And we think that the geometry um, after the black hole ev evaporates looks uh, roughly something like this, that eventually the black hole will become smaller and smaller. And at some point, um, it will become very small of order the Planck size. And there, we cannot continue to trust the equations. But it will have a small mass of order the Planck mass there. And let's assume that uh, when that reaches, when it reaches that point, it will emit just a few quanta, and that's it, and that it will reconnect and become flat space again. So there is some question of exactly what happens here, but um, it's, uh, you can make the hypothesis that perhaps we go back to the original uh, flat space. So we'll, we'll make this hypothesis. We'll, we could discuss if, if you have, we could discuss what's the evidence for this hypothesis. But, um, um, so, so this. This is the picture for the evaporating black hole. So we have the matter, so there's radiation. And uh, here at infinity, we'll get some radiation, which has a total energy, which is equal to the initial energy of the matter that formed the black hole. Okay. So energy is conserved through this process, um, and so on. So the idea, so this phenomenon is, of course, uh, very surprising, because um, black holes were believed to be black, but now they're emitting some radiation. In fact, they can be white. So as an exercise, exercise, uh, calculate what value of Rh so that the black hole looks white for a white black hole. Okay? So that will look white to your eyes. So you, you need some uh, knowledge of uh, what wavelengths you see white and so on. <laughs> um, now, if you, for extra credit, you can, uh, um, you can wonder where you'll actually see it. Calculate the flux that comes out of the black hole. Use the black body, black body formula. The black body formula is not exact up to factors of order one. I mean, it's, it's, the factor of order one is wrong, but the order of magnitude is correct. So use the black body formula. Calculate how much energy uh, it is emitted and see whether your eye can see it. You know. um, um, and for extra, extra credit, um, understand whether the, 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 this will be some black hole. And of course, in order to see it, you will want to be close to it. But there are big tidal forces near a black, some, such a heavy object. So see whether you could actually survive being close to a black hole so that you can see it. Close enough that you can see it and that you survive. OK? So some exercise in tidal forces order of magnitude. It's kind of a fun exercise. I, I found it fun. Um, OK. Mm. Now, what's the next topic? Ah, we go back to the Euclidean black hole now. Um, and we'll do one more calculation with the Euclidean black hole. Um, and that's uh, the following. So we'll calculate the, so we said that normally in uh, quantum field theory, uh, we can go to Euclidean time 
on a circuit. We put the quantum field theory in Euclidean time, and that quantum field theory with Euclidean time is computing for us uh, the thermal ensemble of the corresponding thermal field theory. So the idea is that uh, if we compute the partition function or the path integral on this geometry, that will give us the thermal partition function of the system. Right? So e to the minus beta f, where f is the free energy. This is just by definition of thermal partition function, uh, or the definition of free energy. And in the gravity approximation, this is given by, this is approximately given by e to the minus uh, the gravitational action. So this is the leading order classical approximation. And then we could consider quantum gravity corrections or quantum corrections. We'll discuss the quantum corrections in a second. For, for now, we'll calculate just the classical action. And this uh, classical action is just the usual Einstein action, 1 over 16 pi g newton uh, square root of gr. And if you want to seriously do this calculation, then you need to realize that you need to put a boundary term um, where this is the metric at the boundary. So this is an integral over four dimensions. So let's say, let's call it m4. And then this is the boundary of m4. So, um, and if you, so you can calculate this. So this boundary term is necessary so that we have a, a good variational principle so that when we derive the equations of motion, we don't get extra equations of motion at the boundary um, for a problem where we fix the metric at the boundary. So you can calculate this, and unfortunately, you'll get infinity. Okay, and that's the problem. But this infinity is just proportional to the length to beta, so it's a bit like a, a ground state energy subtraction. And so you subtract that infinity. I won't discuss the details of how to do that. Um, but that infinity that you subtract is independent, let's say, of the mass of the black hole that you were considering. But, but you subtract that infinity, and um, then, um, yeah, so th this infinity looks like beta times some infinity that is independent of beta. Uh, so you subtract it, um, and then you get something finite. And that finite thing, um, you can view it as, uh, well, my, this is minus i. So you can look at, view it as the logarithm of the partition function, or beta minus beta f. And then you can calculate, if you calculate the energy using the usual thermodynamic formula, um, you find that it is equal to the mass of the corresponding black hole. And uh, you can also calculate the entropy. And if you calculate the entropy, you find, using the form, usual formula, uh, you find that it's equal to the area of the horizon uh, divided by 4 g newton. So the horizon is a, is a sphere. And you can calculate the area of the horizon. Um, and um, yeah, so we get this remarkably simple formula. And I we, will exp we will see later uh, a derivation of why this formula is so simple. Oh, sorry, I, yeah. The most important formula is down in the part that you cannot see. S equal to area over 4G Newton. This will be a very important formula. And um, here we derived it using the Euclidean black hole. Um, and um, I, I didn't show you the details of this derivation. We'll, we'll derive this formula in more detail in the next lectures, uh, where it, it will actually be a generalization of this formula. That's why I'm waiting to, to show it to you. Um, but uh, it's a remarkable formula. Just the area this is true for black holes in all dimensions, all kinds of, uh, uh, well, uh, with matter, without matter, et cetera. Um, OK, so that's, that's that. Um, actually, to, to be, and in fact, that, that a formula uh, like that, the formula that the black hole should have an entropy proportional to the area, was suggested by Bekenstein by an argument that uh, we'll review in a second. Um, so he said, so normally the entropy uh, in, the, in the space outside is what you could call the entropy outside. Uh, so entropy outside is just the entropy of the quantum fields uh, outside the black hole. And he said, well, we have to include this term area over 4 g Newton. Okay. So this is uh, sometimes called the generalized entropy. And this is a formula that we'll um, discuss quite a bit, uh, various versions of this formula. Uh, so we have uh, both uh, this geometric part that comes from the geometry of the black hole, a somewhat mysterious contribution. Uh, to the entropy, 
And then the entropy that we explicitly see of the quantum fields outside, we could have a black hole and we could have, let's say, some gas that has some entropy outside, we will add this entropy. Um, now, it was realized that um, by Sorkin and others that this entropy outside should also include the entropy of quantum fields outside the black hole. Um, so let me, I don't have a black hole geometry here. But let me draw a Rindler geometry, so a geometry near the horizon. So we have the horizon of the black hole, and we have some slice, and we have, let's say, some slice here. And when we calculate the entropy, we, and we talk about the entropy outside, this is the entropy of uh, everything that is going on in this region. Okay? But if we have quantum field theory, it turns out that the entropy of this region is actually uh, non-zero. And the reason is that in quantum field theory, you can have entanglement between the degrees of freedom here and here. So even though the, the full spatial slice is a pure state with zero entropy, we could have non-zero entropy on the right-hand portion. This is also related to the fact that the, um, let me say this in a different way. So we saw that, um, we saw that if we look at the outside of the black hole, uh, we had uh, Rindler space and that we had finite temperature in Rindler space, right? And so we have a density matrix in Rindler space, which looks like e to the minus 2 pi. This is just the beta of, uh, and times the uh, Rindler energy, right? So in, 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 the, uh, in this Rindler space, we have a thermal state with this uh, density matrix, um, just a thermal density matrix. And so you might wonder, well, how, how can it be that we started with Minkowski space and we got uh, something with non-zero entropy uh, thermal state? And the reason is that um, we are considering only half of the space, not the full space. If we were to consider both sides of the space, we would get something with zero entropy. Um, very good. Now, unfortunately, this entropy outside is infinite. Okay. Now. This is a common experience in quantum field theory that anything you want to calculate will typically give you something infinite. Okay. So um, let, let's try, try, try to explain why it is infinite. So let's be naive. Let's try to calculate it. So we said that the proper temperature here went like it was proportional to 1 over rho, 1 over the distance. right? So well, we just integrate the rho and the area. So the, the area just gives the total area, transverse area. Um, and then we calculate the entropy density as a function of rho. And since the local temperature is uh, this, imagine we have a gas of massless particles. This will behave like temperature to the d minus 1 by dimensional analysis for entropy density. Um, and therefore, uh, this will go like uh, 1 over rho to the d minus 1. So we end up with an integral, which is uh, integral d rho over rho to the d minus 1. And uh, it's divergent at small rho. Okay? So we put some cut of epsilon, and then we get something which uh, goes like area over um, epsilon to the d minus 2. So in any number of dimensions. Uh, so in four dimensions, it's one area over, air, over epsilon squared. Okay. So this is the entropy of the quantum fields. Um, OK, that's, uh, that's what we got. Um, Now, it looks somewhat similar to the black hole entropy. And in fact, it's, it, many people were tempted, tempted to put epsilon equal to L Planck or, or epsilon squared to be 4 L Planck squared uh, so as to get the black hole entropy. Okay? But there is no well-controlled computation of that kind because um, when we are doing quantum fields in a black hole background, we should always choose the cutoff to be bigger than the Planck scale. Okay? Uh, it's part of the rules of uh, doing effective field theory, um, of gravity as an effective field theory, that you are supposed to pick your cutoff to be bigger than the Planck scale, which is where the theory becomes strongly coupled. Okay. Should, should I explain that point? That's a very important point, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether... Um, is, there a, is there a set of lectures on effective field theory and gravity as an effective field theory organizers? OK, well, this is a side, uh, completely side comment, OK? Um, 
we are discussing uh, quantum aspects of black holes. But normally, you might have heard that you cannot quantize gravity. So what are we doing? Okay. Now, the statement that you cannot quantize gravity is somewhat incorrect. Um, we cannot define, it is correct in the sense that starting from the theory of gravity. Uh, but what we can do is we can take gravity and treat it as a, an effective field theory. Now, an effective field theory is uh, not a completely well-defined field theory. It's a field theory that is well-defined order by order in some small parameter. Okay. So in the case of gravity, we have uh, an action with a dimension full constant, 1 over g Newton, integral of gr. Right? So this is our classical action. And uh, it, uh, it, the action, so if we consider a configuration, let's say, in four, in, well, in any number of dimensions of overall length scale L, uh, we will have some length scale R. Maybe, maybe let me call it R uh, or RH. So for, let's say, a black hole, that's the typical characteristic size, which is RH. Uh, this will, this, uh, the action, the overall size of the action will scale like RH uh, to the D minus 2 over G Newton. And this is just the formula for the entropy, area over G Newton. Okay. So the effective coupling, so there is uh, an effective coupling square, uh, which for all computations involving quantum fluctuations around the black hole, uh, graviton fluctuations around the black hole, and so on, goes like 1 over S, where S is the, the entropy of the black hole. That's for a four-dimensional, that, that's for any Schwarzschild black hole. In, in ADS, it's slightly, well, in ADS, the constant that appears involves the uh, radius, the, 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 the curvature scale of ADS in units of the Planck scale. Um, so to the extent that R is bigger than uh, G Newton or L Planck, um, RH over L Planck to the D minus 2. So as long as RH is bigger than L Planck, this effective coupling is, const is small. Um, so when we calculate anything, we will uh, calculate it to, let's say, we calculate in the classical theory, which give us something. And then there will be corrections which are uh, suppressed by this effective coupling, and so on. Okay. Now, if we had a good quantum theory, we could calculate all these corrections. Okay. Now, in gravity, uh, what happens is that, as in any many quantum field theories, you, when you calculate, you get infinities here. Okay. Um, now, in good quantum field theories, you can absorb those infinities into a redefinition of these effective couplings. Here, uh, you can't. So there will be some infinities you, which you cannot absorb into a renormalization of G Newton. Though this infinity that we were discussing here is uh, one that you can indeed absorb in the renormalization of G Newton. So here we got some infinity. And this particular infinity, um, so we have some area. So we have some entropy, which is area over 4 G Newton, the very value of G Newton, plus a term which goes like 1 over epsilon squared. And we can define a new renormalized G Newton, which is this, uh, so that this is G Newton renormalized. Now, in order to make sense of this computation, you need to define your cutoff carefully. And you'll find that the same renormalization of G Newton works for other uh, observables you can compute at one loop. Okay? So that's an example of one that you can absorb. But there will be others that you cannot absorb. But in this. In, However, the number of the ones that you can absorb is finite. So at one loop, in four dimensions, for example, you will have terms that are for the form r squared, for example, up to r squared. So you have, you have infinities which you can absorb in the cosmological constant, infinities you can absorb in G Newton, and infinities you can absorb in the coefficient of uh, terms that go like r squared. Okay? So let me, uh, so there is a new, new coefficient g tilde. Okay? There are new coefficients that appear multiplying r squared. So at each order, there is uh, a finite number of unknown coefficients that you don't know. Okay, so, so this g effective, and then there will be also some function of the g prime effective, and so on. And as you go to higher orders, you have more and more of this unknown coefficient. But always a finite number at each order. Um, so this type of structure is what's called an effective field theory. So it works nicely. You, there are many, the number of observables you can calculate at each order is infinite. You can calculate many things, scattering amplitudes as functions of uh, all kinds of and so on, and, and you can calculate them in terms of a finite number of unknown parameters, except that the number of unknown parameters grows as you go to higher and higher orders. Okay. Good. 
So gravity makes sense uh, as an effective field theory through this kind of structure. Um, and many of the calculations that we'll discuss through these lectures uh, make sense uh, with this approximation. Um, and yeah, so, and so Hawk Hawking radiation can be calculated in this approximation. And when you do this, of course, uh, you have to be considering always length scales and cutoffs and so on, which are always um, which, which are always small compared to uh, the scale at which uh, the theory becomes strongly coupled. That scale is given by the Newton constant, which is dimensionful. So when these fluctuations, if we have a length scale which is small enough so that uh, the action becomes a further one, those fluctuations are very large and uh, should not be included in the theory. So you put a cutoff which is bigger than that, length scale cutoff which is bigger than that. Is that more or less short enough summary that made sense? Okay. Okay, well, that, uh, that put me a little bit behind schedule. Uh, maybe I can just stop for questions. Can you define horizon just to bring that in the, in the context? Yes, yes, yeah, you, you, you have, you have, yeah, the, in, in the, yes. So the, the, question, the question was whether you can define horizons in the effective field theory context. Um, Yes, so you, you, you have some background metric, right? Uh, and then, uh, so it, it, yeah, in this approximation where we treat gravity as an effective field theory, we start with some background metric that obeys the classical equations, and then we consider small fluctuations. Sometimes we might need to slightly shift the, the, the solution so to account to, for possible quantum stress tensors that we generate. For example, in the discussion of uh, black hole evaporation, uh, we had to do that because the, the, the created some something that grows in time, like the loss of mass of the black hole. But you can that and you uh, you get the new solution that what we call the semi-classic. So that's what we start with, and then then that that geometry might have some horizons, and those are uh, well defined, and those are the horizons we'll, we can talk about. Uh, yeah. So I, I think if you consider uh, gravity with, away from this approximation, you might think, oh, well, I have to sum over all possible geometries, and it's a mess, and you, you don't know exactly how to define uh, horizons in that case. Because for different geometries, you have different horizons, and you need to sum them all. It uh, gets more confusing. So in, in the context of these lectures, we will always be in this gravity as an effective field theory. We'll uh, always have the, the background geometry that defines the uh, Yeah, the, the, this formula is, is, is an estimate for, so this is a qualitative estimate for uh, the entropy of quantum fields uh, outside the horizon. And we're concentrated on a region uh, near the horizon. The temperature is large, so uh, we approximate this uh, entropy of massless fields, so the entropy of a gas of radiation. It, it, it's not accurate. Well, first of all, because it diverges, I only wanted to make it reasonable that it diverges in this way. Um, this formula is not completely accurate because the, the so it would, it's reasonable to approximate the entropy in this way as a function as, as uh, d to the d minus one if the temperature is not changing very rapidly. But here the temperature is changing very rapidly. So it's not quite accurate, but uh, it just gives you the order of magnitude and it's a rough estimate. Sorry if I maybe said it too quickly. So important point I wanted to make here is that there is a quantum uh, contribution to the entropy, and that quantum distribution has a UV divergence that goes uh, in, in this way. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to estimate here. We're not calculating coefficients. In fact, it's, it's difficult to calculate the coefficients. You, you need to define the cutoff properly to calculate the coefficient. But it's good enough to estimate how that will blow up with one over epsilon. Yeah, yeah, it's one over epsilon. And then I, I made a statement which is not not totally trivial, that it's not trivial, that you can be absorbed in a normalization of G Newton. So this statement is non trivial because it's saying that in other computations that you might do, let's say scattering amplitudes or whatever, where you do you calculate the one loop contributions, G Newton is renormalized in this way. And so it requires a non trivial calculation to show that this is indeed the way that G Newton is renormalized. Yes? Yes. 
same computation goes into three body factors, or um, yes, yes, in the sense that it involves solving the understanding better the properties of quantum fields in the near horizon geometry, but. Um, it, it involves uh, subtracting these divergences and others that are a bit subleading uh, better also. Now, if, if you really want to calculate these corrections, uh, let me let me argue why we know that this should work, OK? So we know this should work because um, that computation that we just did is uh, equivalent to taking uh, this computation in the Euclidean black hole and, uh, and then including the quantum corrections, right? So in this formula that we had here, we just multiply by the one-loop corrections, which is a, they take the form as a determinant of the quantum fields around the black hole backgrounds, we take, at least in, for simple theories. So, um, so this is some kind of uh, determinant of those quantum fields raised to some powers. Okay? Um, so that's uh, the contribution of the quantum corrections. Under general principles, uh, we, we know that those uh, determinants have divergences, but those divergences are proportional to the volume of the space and the curvature of the space and so on. Um, and so they can be absorbed into the counter terms that we discussed previously. Because this space is just a smooth space, so it will be, they will be absorbed in those terms. Um, and so uh, then if we, if we do that computation and then we calculate the entropy using this, using this factor, we will get here a formula which is equal to this plus some s uh, outside, right? But this, the s outside, we subtracted the counter terms. Or more precisely, is the s outside plus some s of some count, the, the counter terms in such a way that the whole thing is finite and we, will work out uh, properly. We should uh. probably cut it here because we're a few minutes over. Let's thank Juan again. <laughs> Correlate our wardrobes ahead of time. No. <laughs> this is not the first day of. This is not the first time that on the first day of Tassie that Juan and I wore the same shirt. <laughs> so there's some sort of entanglement going on here. Um, just to remind you all, so we're, we're done with lectures for the day, but it's seven o'clock on the eleventh floor of the Gamma Tower. Be the reception. Please go on the ground floor to the lobby. You can either walk through this building one floor down over to the lobby of the tower or just walk outside and then go in there. And I think we're going to be doing the, the parting and stuff. So we'll see you there. Before we talk to Juan, will someone take a picture of the two of us? Because I need to come <laughs> This has happened not once but twice. <laughs> well, there's a finite number of shirts. Right? It, it's true, but it's always you. <laughs> but because I'm wearing the shirts. So. Oh, one, two, uh, three. Thank you. I intended to bring all Tassie shirts, but uh -huh. I only found two, so I only, right. only well, this, have two Tassie This is a good shirts. one, and it was, it, was, it was the last before pandemic. <laughs> so, so, so if you add in this color term to the effective filtering, yeah. then...